Can you help explain to me and our audience how with the Fed's balance sheet about to hit $7 trillion, how silver is still 15 bucks? Well, uh, that's a good question. As you know, gold has done much better than silver in this rally, which in a bull market for precious metals is uh, unusual. Uh, in a bull market for precious metals, silver should outperform gold, especially given that silver is now uh, at or near a historic low compared to gold. Hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcadia Economics. And as we wrap up another trading week, which has been full of exciting activity, um, my highlight of the week was Jerome Powell, after printing everything over the last two months, has said he's concerned about the outlook and aggressive action might be needed. I can't figure out what aggressive action is when you've already <laughs> printed everything. So fortunately, I am joined by Dr. Mark Faber of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report, who's going to break that all down for us. Real quick, one note before we get started. Today's episode is brought to you by Miles Franklin. So if you are interested in buying, selling, or storing any of the precious metals, um, if you'd like a price quote or anything, Arcadia at Miles Franklin. And with that out of the way, Dr. Faber, it sure is great to see you again. I love your smile. It's wonderful. <laughs> I know you had a cold last time we talked, so you look like you're doing well and uh, life is good it's over okay. there. <laughs> and uh, to kick things off, I thought of a fun question this morning that um, I thought you'd enjoy. Can you help explain to me and our audience how with the Fed's balance sheet about to hit $7 trillion, how silver is still 15 bucks? Well, uh, that's a good question. As you know, gold has done much better than silver in this rally, which in a bull market for precious metals is uh, unusual. Uh, in a bull market for precious metals, silver should outperform gold especially given that silver is now uh, at or near a historic low compared to gold. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know exactly why this is happening. Uh, maybe silver is perceived to be more an industrial metal than gold, the way platinum is considered an industrial metal more than uh, gold is. But I think that both silver and gold are relatively cheap compared to gold. And of course, uh, all precious metals, in my view, are inexpensive uh, compared to the money printing by central banks around the world. I mean, it's not just uh, the last episode of money printing, which in the US was first denied, but basically it started end of August 2019, with the interventions in the repo market. But it has continued and has accelerated. And as you just said, uh, when Powell says we need to do, take extraordinary measures. Well, I think the problem is that the Fed, and this is in economics, a subject that needs to be discussed more often the effectiveness of interventions. Uh, if the economy was doing very badly, I can understand some intervention. But we had since 2008, when they embarked on uh, QE1, they decided to launch QE1. It was then launched in the first quarter of 2009. But basically since then, we had continuous money printing. It's not just a one-time measure. Uh, first, it was QE1, then QE2, then Operation Twist, then QE3. And then they stopped in the US, to be fair. But the other central banks around the world started, started printing money like there is no tomorrow. So overall, if you look at the balance sheets of central banks, it kept on going up. Uh, there was a 
a lull, in other words, the pace of expansion of balance sheets uh, diminished, but it continued to go up. And what happened is as they printed money in Japan and in Europe, uh, the money that was printed there then flowed into US dollar assets and created the colossal asset bubble we have in the US. And now the US is doing it again. So if I look at precious metals relative to the money printing, I think they're reasonably inexpensive. Yep. And in the case of silver, uh, it is also very inexpensive compared to gold. Mm -hmm. That there's no question about it. But you understand, I want to make this very clear to everyone. The danger of money printing is that the easy part is to print the money. Yeah. But what the central bank will never know precisely, they have some assumptions and they can guide it uh, to some extent, but basically precisely they don't know. And this is where that money will flow to. You understand? Assuming a central bank goes into the marketplace and buys treasuries, or it buys, in the case of Europe, sovereign bonds or corporate bonds, or in the case of Japan, it buys ETFs. When they buy some of these financial assets, there is a seller. So the seller can be an insurance company, it can be a mutual fund, it can be essentially anyone and he will then get the money from the central bank that bought his asset and then he will decide what he will do with this money it's far from certain that he decides to go and buy anything you know he could go to disney park or he could go to a casino or he could buy a car but he can also save it and he can also buy stocks with it. Yep. He can buy bonds with it. He can buy real estate with it. He creates liquidity, but exactly what he will do with that money, nobody knows. And at times, this money printing by central bank has led to a lot of consumer price inflation. Well, this hasn't been the case uh, since 2008, although I'm sure that prices for most of your listener have gone up more or the cost of living have been going up more than the central banks would uh, claim but the asset prices went up a lot and that created then this wealth inequality issue the fed of course says well this is of no concern to us this is a fiscal matter but you understand, I'm just now doing a study about uh, Schumpeter, the economist Schumpeter. Mm -hmm. Schumpeter along, and I have to give credit to John Maynard Keynes, he's not my favorite economist, but Schumpeter, Keynes, and uh, Karl Marx, these were intellectuals. These were really historians. They analyzed uh, how societies change and they analyzed how the capitalistic system works. The, today's economists are all a bunch of dumb academics that have yep. that are clueless, clueless. So when they don't understand something, they say it's not my responsibility. My responsibility at the central bank is to print money and that's it when things go bad but the problem is and this is a problem in society that this money printing creates wealth inequality and then it creates a lot of unhappy people that then embrace socialism with open arms you understand they look at jeff bezos and I admire Jeff Bezos, he's created something, but without money printing, he wouldn't be that rich. You understand? I have, uh -huh. I admire all these people, 
because these are the innovators. But uh, the money printing side, I don't admire because it has actually disenfranchised a lot of people and it has been bad for the marketplace in the sense that it kept zombie companies alive. A lot of companies should, this is the most important in the capitalistic system is that from time to time, the system is purged and that the inefficient manufacturers are kicked out and that they're not supported. What we have is kind of a life support organization where whenever anything goes wrong, the government comes in and then helps people stay alive. Uh, from a humanitarian point of view, I understand that. But society should be built to withstand any crisis. You understand? People should have savings, but the savings part was always discouraged by these lunatic academics that run central banks. I couldn't agree more. I went to Wharton for an MBA where Jeremy Siegel was teaching stocks for the long run. <laughs> I still remember sitting on the New York Stock Exchange in 2009 when I read a fellow from Harvard named uh, Greg Mankiw who was saying the real problem is, well, people are still saving. We're not getting to spend. He was advocating negative interest rates back then, which I'm guessing you may have seen that uh, Kenneth Rogoff was bantering yeah, about. Yeah, sure. Although just in case there's anyone maybe hearing this for the first time, just to demonstrate that the great Dr. Faber over there is not talking about anything theoretical. Here is Ben Bernanke's op-ed in the Washington Post. This, as you can see, is back in 2010, right before he launched QE2. Dr. Faber, I'd like to read this, this one paragraph to you, if I may, and then I'll let you comment because I've giggled over this for okay. the past 10 years. Ben summed up QE2 saying, this approach eased financial conditions in the past and so far looks to be effective again. I'm not sure by what metric. Stock prices rose, long-term rates fell when investors began to anticipate the action. Easier financial conditions will promote economic growth. Lower mortgage rates make housing more affordable. I don't think that's close to being true. Um, but yes, it does allow them to refinance, tack on more debt. Lower bond rates will encourage investment. And higher stock prices will boost consumer wealth and help increase confidence, which can also spur lending and increase spending will lead to higher economic profits that in a virtuous circle will support further economic expansion. I'm still waiting for Ben's circle to manifest. And I'd point out, as you well know, that, yeah, I get Corona's happening, but they were cutting interest rates before Corona was ever known. So anyway, um, thoughts on that whopper from Ben and how it's played out since then, supporting what you're saying about these academics and their theories that we're paying the cost of. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think that of course, in a society, people have to be responsible for what they do themselves, you, you understand? I mean, everybody gets a salary and some people can save or should save and some people don't want to save. That is each person's own responsibility. But I don't think that the government and its agencies should really encourage people to be financially irresponsible, you, you understand? There's a difference between uh, free to choose, you're free to choose this or that. Nowadays, our freedom to choose has been diminished, that for sure. Maybe less so in Colorado than in other places, but nevertheless, it has happened. And uh, the government's policies, under the influence of these damn intellectuals, and I'm also an intellectual, I also have a PhD, but I'm telling you, if the world is run by intellectuals, we'll all be bankrupt permanently, we'll go back to the stone ages. Uh, I mean, it, it's- Just imagine a world run by Greta Thunberg 
and by Bernanke or by Yellen and uh, by some other nutcase, Fauci. <laughs> yes, that would be the day. I mean, maybe, maybe he'll be the next Fed chairman. I mean, he seems qualified. Although I got, a, I got a question I would love to hear your opinion on. Feel free to pass if you'd like. But especially, you know, you see this long enough, then you start researching the history of the Fed. You learn about Rothschilds funding both sides of the war. Do you think that these guys in the Fed, whether it's Bernanke or insert another name, do they, is it really they just studied Keynesian economics that long and they, they, they're just misguided and think this is going to work? Or is there some degree to which these guys know darn well what they're doing and what we just saw was the latest broad day bank robbery? <coughs> well, I think that uh, the last Fed chairman who was an intellectual was Greenspan. Mm -hmm. He knew uh, that what he's doing, <laughs> he, he, he's just doing it uh, because Essentially, that's what the system asked him to do. But he knew right from the start that it's basically wrong. He also admitted to me, because I knew him from the 70s when we worked at the same firm, he admitted to me that uh, he never said that the Fed was independent. You know, I asked him once, uh, if you look back at your life, could you, would you do something different? And he mumbled, jumbled, uh, something as he always did. But uh, I then said, you know, I really want to know, is the Fed independent or not? And he said, I never said that it's independent. <laughs> yeah. But the point is, I think the employees of the Fed is like if you ask the Nazis, you know, at Nuremberg, uh, well, didn't you know that uh, you did something bad? They said, we were following orders. You understand, if you go through custom or you go through immigration in the US or security and they treat you like shit and you tell them off, they say, look, we're following orders. This is always the excuse of uh, people hiding behind uniforms or behind or when people do something evil, they always say we're following procedures, orders. And at the Fed, they will argue, well, our mandate is to uh, look after the stability of money, which they haven't achieved since uh, the dollar buys, of course, cash is essentially, or has depreciated a lot, not against other currencies, but say, it's depreciation, uh, depreciating against the price of stocks and bonds and uh, gold and other uh, real estate. So uh, there has been a loss of purchasing power. There's no question about this. Uh, I grew up in the 50s. I know what prices were at the time. Mm -hmm. And I have lists of prices of McDonald's in the 60s. And I see what they are today and so forth. It's not that they haven't gone up anyway. But the other mandate of the Fed is to generate growth. But the policies uh, with money printing, in my view, is actually destructive for growth. Because if you analyze it very uh, carefully, the money printing actually finances the expansion of the government. So the government becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And what does a bigger and bigger and bigger government do? They annoy you more and more and more with regulation and all kinds of chicaneries. Wow. And then, of course, economic growth slows down. The other thing is that uh, needs to be considered very carefully especially in the context of this crisis, in my view, they are nowadays almost monopolies in some industries. In other words, they control the industry fairly well. And so innovation diminishes 
and the uh, monopolistic companies actually they work with the government to keep their monopolies so it has a negative impact on economic growth not to mention uh, on freedom yeah and that's that's why another one of the reasons why it's scary to me seeing the way the government is now nationalizing industries basically it, it seems like they're playing poker and like all right well uh, airlines yeah i'll take that give me a couple more basis points on autos and um <laughs> Reminds me of, uh, I actually read Dick Cheney's autobiography a couple of years ago, and he talks about the meeting in which he was part of the meeting prior to Nixon taking everybody off the gold standard and inserting price controls. And he talked about how it was just like a bunch of middle-aged chain-smoking white guys in a room bannering like, all right, you know, I'll give you this many basis points on toupees, dill pickles can go up this much. And it's just... Uh, a negotiation <laughs> to them. Although you mentioned a minute ago the independence or lack thereof between the Fed and the president. I wonder if that's just been a charade they've propagated for a while. Although, again, this week, Donald Trump hailing gift of negative rates that Fed officials disdain. Um, although what I wonder if the current 10-year bond yield is 0.6%, and the Fed still has a 2% inflation mandate. Am I correct? I mean, we don't need John Williams' shadow stats numbers anymore. This rate is already negative. Yes, I mean, I think uh, we've had negative rates for quite some time. Uh, if you measure what the true cost of living increases are, because the cost of living increases uh, for families, especially if they have children, has gone up quite a lot. If you have children uh, that go to college or so, I mean, yesterday or the day before the New York Times published an article and they had asked 500 readers to describe a little bit their lifestyle uh, compared to the lifestyle of their parents when they were 40 years old. Yeah. And most of them said that they live in much worse financial conditions than their parents did. Mm -hmm. And not marginally, in much worse condition. One said he lives in a better condition, but these people, his parents had come from Jamaica and had just started working in New York. So they had nothing at all. They were refugees. Uh, but otherwise, kind of the middle class people, they all said our parents, uh, they had a house and they could pay it down and they never had any student debts to worry with. And some of them, they had student debts. There's no way in a million years that they can pay them back. Partly, again, uh, because of their own mistakes. They had student debts, but then they get married, have children, and then they get divorced and so forth and so on. But you understand? We have a society today where younger people, really the majority, uh, lives in worse conditions than, say, my generation. Much worse conditions. I, I would imagine it's harder for the people who are just trying to have a place to live, eat food, and take care of their family. I'm guessing it's harder for most people now than before the Industrial Revolution and it's like all this technology is supposed to make life easier, but when you have the Fed coming in anytime, I don't know if they're confusing deflation with productivity, but they must be watching uh, Wall Street with Michael Douglas and they see that cinder block cell phone he has and they're, they must be you know, panicking that the cell phone <laughs> is in a million dollars today with that logic. <laughs> yes, yeah. I... Quite frankly, I know quite a few of these Fed governors. Uh, <laughs> the intellect is not very high. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's fascinating. Um, although, but, you know, we are here to make money, and you know, my idea is uh, since your investors are mostly interested in precious metals, I think that uh, if 
the precious metals market uh, or bull market uh, will continue, then silver has a very good chance to shoot up. Yeah. I wouldn't put all my money into silver, but I think that a powerful move is not unlikely. And I can tell you, when they started with QE1, I said to myself, they will never stop. Yeah. Once you embark on money printing, uh, it's very difficult to stop. Equally, when you have this CARES Act, CARES Act is basically uh, a distribution of money. It's not necessarily a fair distribution, but it's a distribution of money. And uh, this money will work. It will, for some people, it works actually quite well because they didn't have a salary before. Now they get something. But it will have to be followed with a CARES Act number two yeah. in, in, say, a month or two. The Democrats have already <laughs> flattered over three trillion dollars <laughs> and that will have to be followed by number three you, you understand and so the fed is behind they have to finance all this without the financing of the fed it wouldn't be possible so they will finance that and in my view we are reaching soon seven trillion fed balance sheet by year end, I'd be surprised if we are below 10 trillion. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Then, yeah. and then it's not going to go down. Believe me, it will continue to go up. Maybe not by 4 trillion or 5 trillion every year. But there may be a year where, when it goes up by more than 5 trillion. That is my suspicion. See, that, and that could at some be this point, year. <laughs> The Achilles heel of all this, and it hasn't happened yet, but it's going to happen one day, is the value of the US dollar. You know, some people say, why isn't gold up more, or why isn't silver up more? Well, up to now, the dollar has been strong. Yeah. And from a technical point of view, I think the dollar may move up a bit more, mm -hmm. you know, but not for long, it can overshoot. And once the dollar starts to go down, it will also bring up interest rates. You know, interest rates will, it, it's going to be very difficult to keep interest rates at the current level or below zero if the dollar is weak. And then they will argue, well, if interest rates go up, it means we haven't printed enough money, so they'll print even more. Mm -hmm. So that's when I expect actually precious metals to go ballistic. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's a great point you raised there because even as insane as this is, I still expect we'll have times where we'll see treasuries and dollar rally, even as they're printing them like they're going out of style. Uh, although I got a fun one for you here. Yes. Because you've been talking about the Fed and how certain things haven't happened yet. But let's say we took our time machine five years or 10 years into the future, pick whichever number you want. Do you think we're sitting here a couple of years from now and the Fed is, has just made itself irrelevant, uh, you know, in the sense that people notice, you know, what Bernanke in his op-ed, what he leaves out is like, yeah, it's going to be Miller time when you're lowering rates and printing money, but wouldn't you expect the exact opposite if you ever undo it? D does this institution at some point blow up and just become obsolete or are, are we at a break point where people start to get it and we go back to something that isn't socialism or how, how does this play out? I don't know exactly how it will play out, but my sense is that uh, I was just writing about this uh, growing up in the 50s and 60s. I experienced a process where my life became freer and freer. But uh, since the late 1990s, I observe a trend where everything becomes more difficult. 
and where you have less and less freedom, also in business, you know, the government comes and checks everything. Then they force you to have compliance officers and so forth and so on. So life becomes more restricted. And uh, after 9-11 anyway, you know, the, the, you could still travel, but they annoy you so much at immigration and treat you like shit. So you, a lot of people said, I'm not going to travel anymore. And then when you go through security, uh, they treat you like a criminal if you have a nail clipper, you know what I mean? It's so stupid. And uh, now with this coronavirus, they took the opportunity to make out of a virus that has limited impact on young people to make it a huge thing so the government can crack down on everything. And I think we're moving uh, into a totalitarian state. That, I believe, you know, where actually the president, Trump or Biden or whoever it is, has very limited power. The power is somewhere behind. Yes. They pull the strings. The so-called, by definition, these are people they work in the shadow. Uh, these are the deep state people. And the central banks belong to these deep state people. They are the financier of these deep state people. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I mean, I don't care that much because at my age, uh, I had my freedom in life and I had a good life. And so if the last 10 years of my life, I can't move here and there and do this and that is not the end of the world. But for young people, I think they better be very, very careful, you know, what measures they support. And I think hopefully there will be a rebellion. But the woke generation, I doubt they will rebel, you understand? Uh, as long as you give them a thousand dollars a month, they'll be on the beach in California and quite happy. Yeah. And then they can continue their discussions about who is politically incorrect and uh, who is a racist and God knows what. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess the positive to all of this is that, I don't know, I'm sure people have been saying this for decades, but it sure feels like we're coming to a head in some of these things. Uh, and that's why I appreciate folks like you that speak up yeah. about these things, which it's it's amazing what happens and how it's unfolding and that you actually see these things taking place now we're not talking about one day anymore it's happening now um i always wonder gee if they ever were planning a reset isn't this kind of what it would possibly look like well <laughs> this has been a reset uh, you know everybody's is poorer than before and the economic outlook is, of course, much worse than before. And exactly how we're going to, I think a lot of industries will not reach the peak they reached in 2019 for years, if ever. And then, I mean, we have to close this interview, but I think the negative rhetoric against China, this anti-China sentiment uh, can lead to war. So it's possible. It certainly is. Uh, we'll pray that that does not occur. One final one and then we'll wrap up and let you get some sleep. Again, I appreciate you joining me late at night over there. Based on maybe summing up everything we talked about, I get the feeling that with the way Wall Street is a momentum chasing crowd that still maybe it's changed a little bit in gold, but I feel like silver, there's still a lot of, well, once it goes over the moving average or when all the funds are buying it, hey, if it goes bad, then I have a cover story. I get the feeling that at some point, probably in all these metals, specifically silver, that you're going to have a lot of people trying to get in at the same time. They find out they can't. And that's when uh, we see some of the big moves. Any thoughts on that? Yes. I mean, I, you said it 
correctly, we have a whole group of people. These are momentum players. You know, if you look at the online stock market accounts with people like uh, Robin Hood and Ameritrade and so forth, these accounts have increased dramatically in the last three months. Dramatically, not a little bit, but dramatically. And these people, they trade. Uh, there was an article the other day that the millennials and the Z generation is buying what Buffett sold. In other words, they're buying airlines. And uh, one day this crowd, uh, which also buys uh, bitcoins and so forth, but one day this crowd will also, or some of these people will also recognize the value of precious metals. And so then they'll buy them. My concern about precious metals is more if the government could do things they have done to us in the last two months, that one day they can take our precious metals away. Now, if you have a few coins, I don't think that this will happen. But if you have bars, you know, like kilos or a ton of silver or a ton of gold, uh, I think they would be tempted to take it away. Yeah. Especially given that the US government probably doesn't have any gold left. <laughs> it's probably want, all I... been stolen. It's all been stolen by the CIA and the FBI and the other organization. I agree with you. I mean, if there's anything in Fort Knox, I'm assuming it's been leased out multiple times. And again, uh, we'll wrap up for today. But that, that's part of why I appreciate all the things that you speak out about genuinely, because really, what can we do in the end? Hopefully, if enough people heed your advice and your experience, um, you know, next time the government tries one of these things, I don't think it needs to be 50%, but if enough people realize, wait a second, no, you, you can't do this and actually stand up, speak out. We saw a couple of years ago when they tried to buy, bomb Syria and Obama was all ready to send the missiles in there and the people were like, no, we don't want this. So yes. I think it starts with <laughs> folks like yourself. This is the most absurd uh, wars I've seen anywhere the invasion of Iraq, of Afghanistan, of Syria, no. uh, of uh, Libya, doesn't make any sense at all. But a lot of money flows, you know, through <laughs> the army, through the military. It does. But it doesn't make any sense. Although, fortunately, for some answers and explanations of this, folks can find your great work at, the, at www.gloomboomdoom.com. Dr. Faber, appreciate you joining me again here. The well, link to his much. website in the bottom below. And uh, we'll look forward to doing this again. Hopefully, one day we'll do this where we have a nice freedom, gold and silver trading freely. <laughs> and, um, yeah. But thank you for joining me. Okay, thanks a lot.